Lord, you would just pray new for most of us in this room and our attempts to apply this in the terms of genomic prediction. And first of all, in general, I want to give a general introduction to deep learning. So it's just a new tool. It's a special case of machine learning. And when we're thinking about it, um, when classifying pictures, for example, of car, if they contain a car or they're not, a traditional machine learning algorithm works that we provide the model with some features it wants to detect. For example, look for a tire, look for a windshield and so on. Whereas in deep learning, this feature extracting process is mostly done by the model itself. So we don't have to even give the model that information of what to look for, but instead let it figure this out itself. And by this, there are a lot of applications in deep learning, for example, in picture recognition, in the programming of AI, for example, in the beating of Go and chess players, but also in speech recognition. Um, when we are looking at the deep learning methods, we often see methods that look like this, like complex structures. I could have also put something like this here. So it's for most of us, it's just a black box or black magic, as it was called previously. And yeah, but what's what's the reasoning of using this? I mean, what we hope by using deep learning is to account for nonlinear relationships in our models. Since in reality, for genomic prediction, we typically apply GBLOB, which just assumes linear <laughs> and additive effects of single markers, whereas in reality, we just know that that's not true, even though it's working quite well. And yeah, because we know that in reality, there is dominance, there are epistatic interactions and so on. Um, when looking at the deep learning network, it typically looks like this. We start on the left hand side with some input variables, for example, SNP data, and we want to end up with some output values. So for example, our breeding values of phenotypes. And everything in between is a layer structure, which, is, which connects the input to the output. And typically what is done is that each layer is, each node of a layer is just the combination of the nodes of the previous layer. For example, in this case, um, the nodes in the Z layer would just be a combination of the input layers. Uh, so Z1 is just uh, the combination of X1, X2, X3 times some parameter one wants to optimize and so on with the previous layers. So T1 is a combination of the Z1, Z2, Z3 and Y is a combination of T1 and T2. <coughs> Probably mathematicians now are a bit skeptical why apply multiple linear models in a row. We just need to perform one additional trick and that is after each layer we apply a nonlinear transformation to, to this fitting procedure. And we can basically choose whatever function we want. We typically choose a simple one. A, a common one used is for example the Zygmunt function. And yeah, that's basically all that there is to it. And when looking at these layers and models, we typically observe that we have still infinite number of parameters we want to fit. So an exact solution of this model is just not possible. So instead what we do is to optimize this network numerically. And a typical approach here is gradient descent. This means we have some target function, for example quadratic deviations, and look, fit each layer after each other in doing small changes to the parameters and look in which, which direction our target function, the value is decreasing and then do small changes in that direction till we're ending up with a model we like. Um, when it comes to, to models, there are a lot of different types of layers that are possible. Uh, the most basic one is called a fully connected layer, which basically means that all nodes of one layer are connected to all nodes of the previous layer. A second one would be a convolutional neural network. This would focus on local features and combine adjacent variables. For example, in picture recognition, when we're here looking at a picture of a cat, we would first try to identify local features like here's an eye, here's an eye, here's a nose, here's a mouse, here are two ears. This in the next layer would then be classified as a cat, for example. And it can, can become even more complex when, for example, classifying a golf player and a baseball player, 
these local features are quite similar. Both use a club, have a belt, have, have a hat and similar arm motions. But when comparing videos, the swing motion, for example, would be different. So that's an additional step we could take. But my message I want to send is that it's really important to think what, what are the implications of using what kind of model. And especially in our case, we are working with SNP data. And I mean, the most commonly used method here are convolutional neural nets. And as seen in some previous publications, Typically, convolutional neural nets tend to not work for this. And with, at least for me, that totally makes sense because when we're looking at the convolutional neural network, this assumes that there are some, uh, some local interactions, which, so example, we would try to assign a, a specific sequence with an effect. For example, this sequence of 2201, 220. But as in the traditional case of a convolutional neural network, this sequence would be assigned with the same effect in every different region, whereas the sequence is coding dependent and it just doesn't make sense from a genetical perspective to assign the same effect to different marker sequences. I mean, I would totally agree that when we were working on base pair level, that could probably work, but on markers, which are coding dependent with probably some variation in between the markers, that's just something that just isn't supposed to, to be better. Um, now I'm coming to our application, and for this we used 10,000 volts, which were genotyped on a 50k chip. The data was provided by the VIT, and for this we had deregressed breeding values for a couple of traits ranging from a higher heritability like milk yield, fat and protein up to lower heritabilities like somatic cell score and non-return rate. When it comes to our model, we decided to first use a locally convolutional layer that's with a similar idea of a convolutional network to connect adjacent markers but with different parameter settings in each region of the genome. And afterwards, we just used some fully connected methods and applied it on our data set. From a data structure, we used a data set and split this up into a training and a test set and just wanted to do the fitting at first. We could also done cross-validation here, but that's just a natural starting point. When fitting our model, we quickly observed that, yeah, whereas the model works quite well on the training data, basically our rates go down to zero, we quickly go into an overfitting process. So our test data is quite well explained after 20 epochs or 20 iterations of each data point being used in the fitting procedure. But with more iterations, error rates go up again. So we had to do something against that. And there are a lot of different methodologies in deep learning, like increasing penalty on higher parameter settings or, or randomly setting some parameter values to zero. But one approach which is really important for us and not that often used in genetic is the introduction of, of a validation data set. This means we split it up our training into a training and a validation set and only fitted our model on the training set and afterwards evaluated the model on the validation set from which we know the, the estimated breeding values. And based and then we compare mo mo models after every iteration and choose that model for wi which works best on the validation set. And this can not only be used to answer the question of at, at which iteration to stop, but also answer questions in how many layers to use, how many nodes to use, and what target function to use, and all those open questions in the designing of our models. When looking at prediction results, we compared our uh, the correlation of the uh, estimated breeding values with our inputs, so the deregressed breeding values, to a common method used in genetics, so GBLOB. And over all traits, results were quite similar. It's, it's really not earth shedding, but at least on the same level, till a bit better in, for most traits. But what we also have to note here is that we are working on deregressed breeding values. That means that some of the epistatic interaction we are wanting to detect 
are already removed from the model just by working on de regressed breeding values. With this, I come to some further steps we want to do. This is for once we want to extend this framework to GVAS. Um, for example, I mean, we so far have not developed formal test statistics for that, and that's really a general problem in deep learning that's not that easy to see um, which, which 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 variables have an effect in, in the prediction. But just when looking at the parameter values in the first layer, we saw that it's exactly the reason of the most known QTL, uh, knows, most known QTL in milk yield DGAT1 is much higher than every other region in the genome. And yeah, so we really want to inc increase our work in this and also work on automatic fitting procedure, whereas currently we just use the same model for each trait. We really want to optimize parameter settings for different, uh, different traits. And I mean, the most common approach would probably there be group force or grid search method, but we really want to avoid is this as it's really high in workload and instead use machine learning algorithms for this. Also, a possibility we would see is to use haplotypes instead of genotypes. Um, I mean, that's just a different input variable, I guess. And so instead of an input of 50,000 variables, we would then work on a matrix of 2 times 50,000 variables. But in general, that's quite similar. And the last one, working on phenotypes, what I've already mentioned. As a general outlook, I would say that deep learning is definitely a method that can be used for deep learning, but the results are not, I mean, so far are not really earth shedding, but at least promising. And some of, some of the things to note here is in deep learning methods, you really need phenotypes or the same input variable for all individuals. But a possible advantage would be when doing genomic prediction that it's quite easy to incorporate a couple of new in individuals in the model without doing major computations. And as a general statement of what could be possible applications in genetics, so far I showed this quite simple model with SNP data as an input and some breeding values we want to output. Um, what really is promising in deep learning is that it's quite easy to include additional input and output layers. So for example, include expression data or spatial data in our method and do predictions for multiple breeding values at a time. Uh, a second, second big group of applications I would see is, is phenotyping, especially image and video analysis. For ex in this case, two examples, tail biting a pig or just doing field work with drones. And more on the genetic level, uh, we could also think about identification of transcription factors. And here I'm thinking about a recent work uh, of in Cornell of the Buckler lab, which used the base pair data and used it in single genes to predict expression levels and compare which of the two, uh, which of the two base pair sequence will lead to a higher expression level. And as some general recommendations for deep learning, I would really recommend you to not be scared of the technology. All the models I fitted were able to run on my own computer. So it's really not that big of a financial investment to do some first testing. And it's like 25, 30 lines of code. If you have some basic idea of that, there are really good wrappers around that help you with designing these models. And when it comes to designing of models, I would really recommend that people with background in genetics are involved in this process because it's really fundamental in the design of the model to know what you're looking for. I mean, input from informatics people is really highly encouraged, but I don't think that informatics people on its own can, can come up with the same quality of model because it's, I mean, some use of genetics is definitely needed. Um, with this, I want to come to my end and acknowledge some people, mostly my projects for financing me and also the RTG I'm working with, but also the FBF and FIT for providing of the data and Canal Data Science and <coughs> Jacob Washburn for providing me with some pictures for this presentation. With this, thank you for your attention.